Acts chapter 13, your Bibles, and thanks again for those who were not here this morning. I do want to thank you again for allowing Linda and I to be away for about seven days or so, and then thank you for letting us come home to be back in the saddle, serving the Lord with you. I appreciate your faithfulness to the Lord Jesus Christ, and thank you for being a people that I believe have a hunger and a thirst for the Word of God. Uh, I really, I really admire that. I find, I know there is a few folks who maybe come in a little bit weary, and there may be a few folks distracted with a cell phone or some other gadget or things of that nature, maybe a few young people that want to goof around a little bit, but for the most part, I have found you to be very interested people in scriptural things and the biblical things, and I appreciate so much your attentiveness in the services. Acts chapter 13, we turn a page now to where... The focus leaves Jerusalem and now comes from Antioch, which is about 350 miles north of Jerusalem. And in that place is where a very ethnically diverse, growing, going, sending church sends out Paul and Barnabas into the uttermost parts of the world, to the regions beyond. On purpose. Now, there had been other people who had gone. The Ethiopian unit goes into Ethiopia. Philip goes in Samaria, but on purpose, this church, being led by the Spirit of God, send two of their best people to go for the only purpose of giving the gospel and starting what we know today as missions work. Jesus said before he went back to heaven, you'll receive power and you'll be a witness to me in Jerusalem in this city and in Judea, that's the southern part of Israel where Primarily, though educated, the white-collar workers, the, the uh, Orthodox believers, Jews, and things of that nature. And in Samaria, that's the people that were different than us, worshiped different, ate different, thought different, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Now in chapter 13, we get to that, and we really don't go back to Jerusalem again except for in Acts 15 for the Jerusalem Council. And then again, Paul goes back and is arrested there at the end of his life and taken on to, to Rome from there. The church, for the most part, is not mentioned too much in Jerusalem. Now, it seems to be that the church and its emphasis has moved from Antioch. And there, of course, that's where the Christians were first called Christians at Antioch. Paul and Barnabas are sent out from that church. They first go and they leave their area right there in Antioch. They go north a little bit and they work there. And then they catch a boat and they go across the little Mediterranean Sea into an island, Cyprus and, and Paphras. And they work their way through there spreading the gospel. And then they go back to the mainland and find themselves in Pergia. And then, and, and then finally find himself in, in this area that we're going to talk about tonight, in Antioch of Pisaida is where they come to. In between that time, you might remember, they were able to go into a place and bear witness to a man whose name was Paulus, which we possibly think that may have been, it was the first uh, one of the major converts that Apostle Paul led to Christ. It was from this point on, now you don't see the name Saul. You see the name Paul. His Jewish name that everyone recognized him as Saul is now not being used. Now he has the name Paul. Up to this point too, you have Barnabas and Paul. And now the Bible, the Word of God, switches that to Paul and Barnabas. And from the rest of the book of Acts, you'll find Paul is the focus. He is the, he's the leader. God had chosen him to be the leader. Now he was brought in the Christian faith, much because of his friend Barnabas. But boy, it's so wonderful. Someone said this, it's amazing what God would do through people if no one cared who got the credit. I tell you, I could spend a whole message enjoyably speaking on the attributes of Barnabas. A fellow who was, he didn't care who got the credit. He was given to mercy, he loved the things of God, he was very generous, and he was willing to play second fiddle. He didn't have to have the attention, he was someone who made a good thing better. And you know, most of us have that particular ministry. If you look at the different gifts that, that God gives people in Romans chapter 12, verses 4 through 8 there, 
And he talks about the gifts. Some have the gift of teaching, and some have the gift of, of administration. Some have the gift of prophecy. Some have the gift of giving, and some of mercy. And you'll find in there is the gift of helps. People that really, they're really gifted to come along and make good things better and just help somebody and encourage a work. Maybe you're not going to be the bus captain, but you can be a very good bus worker. Maybe you're not teaching the class, but you can help make that class better. Maybe you're not the one in charge, but it doesn't matter to you if I can just play a role. Amen. I love that about Barnabas. Barnabas didn't seem to get upset. He didn't seem to be frustrated. There came a little argument with him, and, and we'll talk about that later, and, and I'll give you what I believe my opinion is about his decision to bring John Mark. But he learned to serve God. And boy, I think you want to look around heaven for Barnabas. You, you want to be a fly on the wall around the judgment seat of Christ watching Barnabas get loaded up, in my opinion. No, there's no messages in the Bible. There's no books, Barnabas, number one. However, I believe he's a very, very rich man at the judgment seat of Christ. Because he, it didn't really matter about him. It mattered about what he could do to help somebody. There's a beautiful song that's entitled, Help Somebody Today. Somebody along life's way. Just find somebody and help them. There's a beautiful testimony for Barnabas. But they go and they win this man to the Lord, and, and it's exciting. And of course, Elimaeus, the sorcerer, comes, and, and he causes some problems, and Paul uses the ninth miracle that the apostles use that's recorded in the book of Acts and blinds the man temporarily. And he goes about trying to find someone to help him find his way back home as he uh, went from being very forceful and, 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 and blasphemous to being very crippled and, and very humbled. Well, there, there are three people traveling, four people traveling now. It's Paul and Barnabas and John Mark, which is Barnabas' nephew. And uh, then we find there's also, and I think probably John Mark was, his parents were wealthy. His mother was where the house, were, where they were staying in Jerusalem whenever Peter was arrested. Everybody was staying with his mom in, in the house, praying that Peter would get dismissed. That's the same guy, and no doubt there's some family, and probably a very wealthy young man. Uh, and then Luke is there. Well, they make their way to Pamphylia, and, and John Mark has had enough. He said, you know what? This is not what I thought it was going to be. We haven't even got a Motel 6. He said, the meals have been meager. We were re we're reaching opposition everywhere we go. This is not what I got in for. I love to think about John Mark. I think about Le Lester Olaf singing, it's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room. It's a fight and not a game. And uh, John Mark didn't hear that message yet from Brother Roloff. And so he... He said in Pepophilia, you know what, I think I'm going back home. And he went on and left Paul and Barnabas and Luke to continue on their journey. And I, I love that, I love, I'm sad about that story, but I also love, I've read the rest of the story. And thank God that for many years, I think Paul really was really hard on him. But at the end of Paul's life, he said, bring me John Mark, but he's profitable unto me. I think that's a beautiful testimony. I'm glad I can fail and not be a failure. I'm glad I can mess up and people give me another chance. I'm glad I can trip up and people help me up and get me on the right path. So I'm glad we have a God of a second, third, fourth, and 10,000 chance. I think, by the way, we need, to, we need to be very gracious with people. Sometimes uh, Christians are really known for kicking their own wounded. Believe in the worst about somebody when really we ought to find good things about them. Try to find a way we can encourage them and help them. John Mark is an example of that. And thank God someone loved him and helped him. Well, they go and then Paul goes into now Antioch of Bethsaida. Not the same Antioch they came. They're hundreds of miles away from there. They've already gone through the ocean, the Mediterranean Sea, and then out of the Mediterranean Sea and onto inland. And now they're in the, they're a lot farther northwest from the old Antioch in a different area. They go there and they go to synagogues and that's just very popular for Paul. He would go to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 
And the synagogues were, Jews were scattered all over the world, so they didn't, the temple was in Jerusalem, so synagogues were little local churches, if you will, gatherings of people and buildings that were primarily for the Jewish people and a few proselytes who would come from other religions and buy into the Judaism and the Jewish faith. Well, Paul would, when he'd go to a city, as was his custom, he would go to this gathering of Jewish people. And he would go there. It was often an exciting time for Jewish people to have a visitor come and be a part of the service. And they probably did not have a pulpit like this and pews like this, although that may have been the case. But oftentimes in their culture, people would just sit down and, and they'd have a visitor. they hey, where are you from? Well, we're, I'm from, I'm Saul of Tarshish. Oh, great. So where did you live? I, well, I was in Jerusalem. Oh, wow. What do you do there? Well, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Wow. So you went to the school. Where would you go to school? The school of Gamaliel. Oh, really? He taught you? That would be like if someone, maybe Dr. Hiles in our, in our circles, who, who taught you to preach? Dr. Hiles. Whoa, really? Come, come and take you out to eat. Tell me about what he, what he told you. Somebody who was famous in the Jewish world, they knew of Gamaliel. He was a very respected man, and Paul had been trained up at his feet. He had been probably sent from, from Tarshish to Jerusalem as a young man to be tutored in the Jewish faith by Gamaliel. So when he would go around the world, he would go into the synagogue there. They would oftentimes, they would ask him, hey, no, are, you, are you Jewish? Yes. Do you know a little bit about the, about, yeah, I'm very familiar with that. From the tribe of Benjamin, stock of Israel, Pharisee of Pharisee. Yeah, I've got a background in that. Went to the school of Gamaliel. Wow. Hey, listen, after we do our readings, would you like to say something? And it gave Paul many opportunities to speak publicly to his people and accomplish what was in his heart to do to take the gospel to the Jew. And this was the first time that we have recorded in Scripture that he got that opportunity in Antioch of Bethsaida. So he went there and, and, he, and he got there. And if you'll look in your Bibles in Acts chapter 13, you'll see in verse number 14, and when he would depart from Perga, he came to Antioch of Bethsaida and went into the synagogue of the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets and the rulers of the synagogue went unto him, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any words of exhortation for the people, say on. Then Paul stood up and beckoned with his hand, Men of Israel, and ye that fear God, give audience. The God of the people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when we dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt, and when the high arm brought him uh, brought he them out of it. So they say, Paul, listen, sir, you, you guys have some exhortation you can give us, something you can share with us? He said, sure. Then he stood up and he said, come here, guys, listen to this. Ye men of Israel and anyone who fears God, hey, listen, let me tell you something. And so he says, our God in his great providence loved his people. And he brought them out of the Ur of the Chaldees through Abraham. And then they were brought into slavery, into Egypt. And with a high arm, with great strength, in front of everybody, took us out of Egypt. And the Jewish heart begins to swell. Oh, yeah. Boy, I love this preacher. He is really tearing it up. This is great. Listen to what he said. He's given her history. And he tells them about Egypt, and boy, they get excited about that. And then he tells them more. He begins to go back and give them history. Now, it's just kind of like you and I. When you hear, like, maybe the story of David and Goliath, most of us don't say, oh, boy, another David and Goliath. Even though I've heard that hundreds of times in my life, I love to hear it again. You ever get with your friends and family reunions, and you go over the same story again? Grandpa tells the same story he just he keeps telling it over and over. He's not, he doesn't have Alzheimer's either, just keeps telling it. But you like to hear it. Here, here, goes, here he goes again. Come, listen, listen. And it's all right. You're, you're happy. Well, these people are excited. And he's, he does this. Now, let me say to you, I think there's a strategy here in witnessing to people. Uh, Stephen used the very same strategy. 
in early part of Acts, whenever he was given a chance to speak before they stoned him, he started with the history of the Jewish people and brought them through. And he tells them about Egypt, and then he tells them about the promised land. I'm, I'm fearful to take too, take too much time on this because it's not the message. But anyway, you can read a little bit later, but he goes to Egypt, and then he says, and then God led us to the promised land and conquered the seven Canaanite nations. And then we inhabited the promised land. Boy, it was great. And we went to that land of milk and honey, and the Jews are saying, boy, I love this preacher. I hope he'll come back again. And then he goes on and says, you know, and then God led us through a period of judges. And he talked about the judges. And then God gave us prophets, and he talks about Samuel. And then our guys wanted a king, and God gave us a king, Saul. And God wasn't pleased with Saul, so he replaced him with a man after his own heart. Now, everybody's tracking with him. They're saying, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, man, this guy knows our history. I'd love to hear it. And then he goes on to say, uh, yeah, and then he skips from David. He talks about David, how, he, how that he was a man of God's heart. Then he skips from David all the way past Nehemiah. He doesn't talk about Solomon or all the kings in the northern kingdom and southern kingdom. He skips all the way to, to pass that and then brings him to John the Baptist. Now, I guess because Zechariah was the high priest in Jerusalem and, or one of the priests there, and, and John, I guess he was pretty familiar. People, when they would go back probably for their annual pilgrimage or their, or their feast, they've heard about John the Baptist. He said, now, now, John the Baptist, now, John the Baptist is prophesied in the book of Malachi. Not by name, but what he would do. He would be the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then Paul says, well, now, listen. Then John the Baptist came. And he began to tell us that the Messiah is coming. And that we should look to the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world. And the Spirit of God descended upon him. And he begins to tell them about John the Baptist. And then begins to say about the Savior, Jesus. And that how that the Jews rejected him in Jerusalem. And then they delivered him over to Pilate. Let's pick up the story if we can, please. In verse number twenty. Uh, seven, for they that dwelt at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. He said they actually played out to be exactly what was prophesied they would do. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Verse 28. For though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, verse number 29, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. You see the gospels preached here. And he was seen many days of them which came with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who were witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you the glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto our fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto, their, unto, un, uh, unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it also was written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Just to quickly stop and explain something. So now he's taken through the history all the way to Jesus. And you can just see, I'm sure that many of them start squirming here. If you can talk about a lot of things, you, you come to Jesus, you better be ready to pucker or to duck. You don't know whether to hug or hide. He's going to be controversial. Now they say, they find, he said, no, Jesus, and he, was, he died. He was buried. And they laid him in a sepulcher, and then God raised him up. And I'm sure there are lots of question marks there. I can imagine if you've ever spoken to people, whenever you, you're talking to people and you come to say something that they're not sure that they're getting, you're getting it to them or they're, they're skeptical, they go, huh? Ha, 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 ha. He actually rose from the dead, right? He said, we're, we're witnesses of that. However, he says, now go back to Psalms 2 where it says that the Lord said to, to Jesus, you, my God, and that he would raise him up. 
And then in Psalm 16, he says that he would not allow his body, his Holy One, to see corruption. Of course, you know the story of Lazarus. Whenever Jesus came to Bethany there and was going to uh, visit Mary and Martha, and they said, Jesus, why didn't you come on time? If you'd have come, Lazarus wouldn't have died. You knew early, why didn't you come? And Jesus wept. And he said, roll away the tomb. Roll away the stone. They said, no, 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 no. It's been four days. After three days, the body in that culture, they, they, that begins to decay and begins to stink. No matter how much perfume and spice and things you put in, it begins to smell real bad. The corruption starts. Aren't you glad that Jesus arose in three days so that his body would not see corruption? They, they, they correlated, oh, it's been four days, too, too late for you to, if you'd have come in two days, maybe we have a chance, but not four, four is, psh, it's corruption. But he said, now, God said in, 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 in prophecy, in, and he brings back the Old Testament verses, now they're tracking, now they're, they're, they're seeing what's happening, and the Bible says in verse 36, for David after he had served his own generation, the will of God, verse number 36, fell on asleep and was laid at the fathers and saw, and, and saw corruption. He said, now, if you think for a moment that David's talking about David in Psalm 16 or he's talking about his son himself in Psalms 2, remember that David's body actually saw corruption, but Jesus did not. You can see how Paul is reading their faces and reading their minds and trying to see where they're coming from. He says, now, oh, no, just in case you think that, now, he's not talking about David. David died. David was buried. David's body decayed. And Jesus did in verse number 37. And he whom God raised saw no corruption. Be it known to you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, Jesus, is preached unto you forgiveness of sins. And by him, Jesus, all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. If you think we're keeping the law and we can, keep, we can get saved on our own, it can't happen. It's through Jesus we have justification. Beware, therefore, lest you come upon you, that come upon you which is spoken of the prophets. Behold, ye despisers. And he quotes Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5, and says, listen, if you, if you reject, when you see the gospel that clearly, and you reject it, he calls them despisers and blasphemers. It's obvious as the nose on your face, watch out, beware lest you reject the Messiah. That's what he says using the scriptures. Verse 42, we read already tonight. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Once again, these words. What kind of words were those? Well, you'll see later on in 44 and 45. Now, now when the congregation was broken up and many of the Jews and the religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who convinced many of them that Jesus was the Christ. They need to accept him. They just, all they did is gave him history and the gospel. Now, at the end of this time, many of the people begin to follow him out of, the, out of the synagogue and say, man, these are great words. This is the resurrection. This is exactly what we've heard. And they followed him and asked for more help. And, and God says they experienced the grace of God. He asked them to continue in God's supernatural help. Now, one week passes. That's one Sabbath day. Now, one week passes, and the Lord picks up his, his narrative here with us. Let's look at verse number 44. And the next Sabbath, seven days had gone by, came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. Now, people left who got saved and who experienced the grace of God. They're telling everybody about it. They're telling people at work. Wives are telling husbands, husbands are telling wives, friends are telling friends, moms are telling kids. Now the, whole, the buzz is about these, two, these three guys who are on this trip teaching about the word of God, and they want to hear about it. Verse 45, when the Jews saw that the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which are spoken by Paul, contradicting 
and blasphemy. So now you have a different group of people. Now the Orthodox, the hard Jewish people, move with envy that now these people are listening to them and not to them and, and they don't like what's taking place. They begin to speak negatively, contradicting and blaspheming the, the truth of God's word. Verse 46, and when Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, it is necessary the word of God should have first be spoken to you, but seeing ye, the Jewish people in this case, put it from you, judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Lo, we return, we turn to the Gentiles. He said, guys, if you don't want to listen, you, may, you, you decide. Judge yourself, but I'm going to find someone that'll listen to this. And if they're not Jewish and they're Gentiles, we're going to go to them. Judge yourself unworthy. You hear the truth, you rejected the truth, we'll find someone else listening. By the way, as a Gentile believer, I'm very grateful for that. But he came into his own, his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them to believe on his name. Then he says in verse 47, For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee as a light to the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be, uh, be, uh, shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad, and they glorified the word of the Lord. And in many, as were ordained to the eternal life, believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. As a result of this, this work and the work of the Spirit of God and the word of God, you'll see that four times in this passage of Scripture, the word of God is mentioned. The gospel is explained and the word of God is being preached. As a result of that, we find several things happen. Number one, that the word of God, verse 49 was published throughout all the region that everywhere people were hearing about the Word of God. Number two, verse 50, read that with me, would you, quick, would you quickly? Verse 50, everyone. But the Jews... ...and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coast. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came to Iconium. Read verse 52, this is a great verse. And the disciples were filled with joy. You see, one thing, the word of God is published. Opposition is experienced. And joy and the Holy Ghost is a result. It's a beautiful testimony. And I, I want to say all this to, to, to say just a couple things in closing. I'll not take long, I don't believe. But I want you to know, first of all, there's a great need to get the gospel out. And I think most of us, we, we, we kind of forget that. And I can be guilty of that as well. We're busy. We got, we got houses to fix. We got jobs to do. We got bills to pay. We got a car payment to make. We got parties to go to and activities to do. But, but let me say to you, there's, there should be a priority of getting the word of God in the hearts of people. That faith coming by hearing is not just for you and me, though it's pop, it is. But the only way people get saved is they need to hear the gospel. And I have got hundreds of my friends here tonight with me. And I want to say to you, everybody ought to be a preacher of the gospel. Every saint ought to be a soul winner. It ought to be, sir, you ought to be telling folks about Christ. Ma'am, you ought to be telling folks about Christ. You ought to get the word out in person and in proxy. Don't, don't neglect your responsibility. Listen, going out and getting the gospel out is not a kind suggestion God gives you. It's a command to be obeyed. And I just want to sober us for a moment to say, listen, what am I doing to get the gospel out? When's the last time I sat down with a sinner and gave him the word of God? Listen, I can't get anybody saved. You can't. Soul winning probably should be termed soul warning. Because it's basically giving people information. And the Spirit of God does the work. You don't get you one. I don't get me one. We, we have the opportunity to share the gospel. And by the way, people need to hear it. 
and get the gospel to people and share the gospel. And it doesn't matter who you are. If you're a housewife, you're a teenager, you're a college student, you're a dad, a mom, a single, a, a, whoever it is, you're a, a senior adult, everybody ought to be passionate about getting the word out. Now, giving is a good way to do that. Linda and I have aggressively tried to give to world evangelism in, in, in ways I never thought I could ever do, and I'm grateful for that because I feel like I have a personal responsibility to get the gospel to the ends of the earth. And, and I'm going to see Jesus in a few days, and I just want to at least have done better than... I know I'm nowhere near God's normal, but I'd like to be above average. I'm nowhere near where I need to be, but I'd like to be at least over where the average person is if I do compare myself. I would like for God to see a heart that is perfect, not perfect, but pure at least, complete, thinking like God thinks, loving what God loves, and he gave his son to pay for the sins, but he's not coming back to, get, to announce it. You and I are his ambassadors. Just like our president doesn't go all around the world and meet in every country. No, he sends ambassadors. And the king of heaven is going to stay there until he comes and receives us in the rapture. In the meantime, he has put his gospel in earthen vessels. That the excellency might be of God and not of us. But what kind of ambassador would go and not do his job? Get the word of God out. When you do that, fine, you're going to have some opposition. And then if you do it, you're going to find that the disciples will have great joy and spirit-filled people will result from that. Now, in closing, I'd like to say this. I see here something that happens. Here we find that there was interest in the Word of God. And all they were doing, if you look in the passage, they were just preaching the Bible. They were just giving people the word of God. People came out to hear the words that these people speak. What words was it? The Bible. Bible preaching is what they were doing. Now, you, for the most part, I see in this room and the people in this church, I, and I told you when I started the message tonight, I think you're some of the best listeners to the scriptures that I've ever spoken to. And I appreciate that. But there were some people who heard the word of God, and then there were other people who listened to the same message and all they could do was criticize, contradict, and blaspheme at the detriment of people who wanted to hear the word of God. Now, these were unsaved people. But I, I will say this, I think I have been guilty of doing that in my life. And I've been saved since I was a young child. Everybody hears the same messages. You hear what the pastor says? It's not from me. I hope every time you come here, if you have an argument, I hope you can take it up with God. I really try to share people the word of God. But when we hear the word of God, oftentimes we can get impressed with the, the style. We can get impressed with the, the mode. We can get impressed with the, the knowledge. But may I say to you, all of us need to let the word of God sink deep inside of us. And evaluate that for our own benefit. Amen. And be very careful that you and I do not just say, well, that was a good message. Oh, I didn't like the way. Be very careful about contradicting scriptural truth. Amen. This is only a suggestion I give you because I see that here and I've seen it in me. And I think it's very, very dangerous because if the word of God will go forth and people will take it and absorb it and then they will, they will apply it to their heart's life. And the Bible says, you know, if you hear these words, happy are ye if you... Application. Every one of us can walk out of any message, any time, any Sunday school class, you ought to walk away with a walkaway truth, a takeaway truth. What am I taking away from that? What am I learning from that message? What did God say to me? And be careful you're not in that group. There's two groups here. One who received it and rejoiced. Other people who heard it and contradicted, evaluated. And by the way, I don't mean you should not evaluate the word of God. The Berean Christians, when they heard preaching, they evaluated that and they went home and studied their Bibles to see if it lined up with the scripture. You can do that all day long. 
Do it every service. I want you to. Make sure it's true to the Word of God. But I will say this, you don't want to become critical in your mind so that you contradict and blaspheme biblical truth and apply it to other people but not to you. Or try to value what that, listen, what does he mean by that? Maybe you should say, what does the Bible tell me? How can I apply this to my heart and life? See, I don't think it's rocket science, friends. The Bible is given to us and it, has, it says one thing. There's one interpretation for the Bible. There are multiple applications, but one interpretation. It's trying to say one thing to us, but we can apply it in different venues. But I want to encourage you, when you hear the Word of God, don't get in that group of people that sit back, bless me if you can. Entertain me if possible. Try to keep me awake. No, no, you better come, and when you come to the house of God, be ready to listen and not give the sacrifice of fools. What is a foolish sacrifice? Quick to open their mouth rather than listen and to absorb and to apply and take a takeaway truth. When I read this past scripture, I really, I get excited, but I also get nervous somewhat. Because I see, I can see myself in both areas. I can be sometimes, I've, I've seen periods of my life where I've taken the truth and I've absorbed it and it's changed me and I like the, what the results are. I've seen other times where I've gone through seasons of my life where I've heard preaching but it just went off me like water off a duck's back. It didn't set in. And it's usually not because of the seed. It's because of the soil. It's because of the heart. The seed is good. It's going to work, but it doesn't, there's nothing soft there. And one of the things I think is a, is a real uh, potential in our church and in churches like ours is that we get really used to hearing truth 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 but it never it never pertains to us the seed falls and it just gets taken away taken away and there's no real deep change there's no real deep conviction because we kind of come to a church like this and it's kind of fun to go to church it's part of my culture i grew up like this I mean, I'm not kidding you. Every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, I've been to church my entire life. I would feel very weird not to be in church on a Sunday night, on a Wednesday night. And I'd, be, I'd probably have some real issues. <laughs> and every time I come to church, I hear the choir sing. And what, what a great choir. Only got half of them up there right now, but it's a great choir. And a beautiful orchestra with unbelievable sounds that come from that. And the announcements can sometimes be entertaining. <laughs> to see a picture of someone getting married and, 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 and listening to a choir, a, a, a special over here, and to hear someone sing and see the guys sing tonight. I mean, I'm kind of used to that. I, I, it's kind of like, it's what I do. It's what I've done my whole life, 46 years of my life. I've been going to church. I've heard thousands of messages. But if I'm not careful, it never sinks in. And conviction is something we haven't felt in a long time. Or if we feel it, we quickly numb it and say, you know, that's not for me. I'll fix that at home. That was a good one right there. I like that way, man. You got me on that one. Ha <laughs> ha. But nothing changes. And then, as a result, there's no joy and there's no Holy Spirit freedom to work. That last verse is a beautiful verse. It talks about the joy and the Holy Ghost, that combination. Let me ask you something. Would your wife, husband, kids, if they could describe you, and they had a several words, frustrated, um, sensitive, angry, joyful. Would they circle joy? When it came to describe you, your teacher, if you're a teacher in your Sunday school class or in the schools, if your kids had to evaluate you, would they say joy? Oh, yeah, joy. Because the Bible tells us that real Christianity is righteousness 
and joy in the Holy Ghost. I'll tell you one thing, I think joy comes, obviously joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit of God. But the Bible says this, my spirit will not always strive with man. I think God sometimes gets really frustrated trying to talk to you and I, and we don't respond to him. We're not disrespectful to him. We don't, we don't necessarily unkind, or, but we just don't respond. We ignore the Holy Spirit. We think about, well, I hope my wife's listening to this message. I hope my kids in school get this. But we're not thinking about us. And the word of God does not fall on, on quick soil. And friend, then we don't have joy. And joy is one of the most attractive attributes of a Christian. Nehemiah says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. That's, that's a strength that God needs to give you, but many of us don't have it. And I think it goes back to the fact, our response to the word of God. We do not let the word of God, we don't offer a, a fertile soil for the seed of the word of God to come and implant beautiful fruit in our life. And so we continue going through life, busy but barren. Active but atrocious. Driving a bus but no joy. Working around, not really. Teaching a class, ushering, in the, ushering, singing the choir, playing orchestra, playing an instrument, running the camera, working in the flight deck, but this is what we do. And there's no joy in the Holy Ghost. I don't know about you, but I don't want to live that way. I like to have the joy of the Lord be my strength. If that's to be the case, I better get back to where when the word of God is preached, when the word of God is read, when it's taught, I present to the Lord a fertile soil ready for the seed to be given, to be watered, to be grown. What is the spirit of God saying to you tonight? Could he be saying to you, hey, this is from the Lord. It's not for your mother, it's not for your brother, it's not for your sister, your husband, your wife, it's for you. And are you going to stay and just ignore the prompting of the Holy Spirit of God another time? Or would you consider allowing him to bring about the fruit of joy in the Holy Ghost? Let him scrub down deep. Words like repentance. Like, Lord, I agree with you. Whoso covereth his sin will not prosper. But whoso confesses. What does it mean to confess? Say what God says. Say, yes, God, I'm wrong. I am very insensitive. I don't even know when the last time I really felt convicted about something. You know, some of you, some of you guys in here this, right now, you curse at home. There's some HB guys who curse in the locker room. There's some CB guys who do the same thing. There's some girls. And you know what? You're just, phew. There's some, there's some guys right now in this room right here, you're watching things you should never watch. They shouldn't be spoken about even in secret. And you're letting us tolerate that. And my friend, you're wrapping up in the cords of your sin. Some of you got bitterness toward people and you will not let it go. It's not you cannot, it's you won't. And you'll not have joy in the Holy Ghost. You're, you're not gonna be a magnet for anything except for more bitterness. More problems to contanker other people around you. You're troubled yourself and you're going to defile other people all, all the rest of you. Get, why don't we decide, you know what, Lord, I don't want to live that way. I need help. And confess, I'm a bitter person, Lord. I'm sinful in this area. I don't want to stay that way. I'm wicked. I'm defiled. I'm thinking of things. I'm doing things that are wrong. God, I don't want to stay that way. I admit to you, I am wrong. And I want to repent, forsake it. And then God says, I'll give you mercy. How about that? You confess, you repent, I give mercy. It's, it's the best deal going. Or you can cover your sin and not prosper. One of the things I don't like to do, I did this on this cruise. I played, I, I went out and exercised. I, th I thought I was gonna walk onto the ship and roll off if I didn't do something. 
A couple days, it was so beautiful, I played basketball for an hour, an hour and a half every day and, and tried to exercise. And then it started raining and it got cold and the basketball court was closed. And so they have this little, little exercise room and these terrible things called treadmills are in there. And these motion bikes, it just, you just sit there and you just, you just walk and you're not going anywhere. It's terrible. And I thought about this principle. You know, I, I'm afraid that many times I have just spiritually exuded a lot of energy and got nowhere. And that's what the Bible says. He resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. He guarantees you that you will not prosper if you cover sin. But if you'll forsake sin and you'll confess sin, then he gives you mercy. Oh, I don't know where you are tonight. Maybe nowhere. But if God would speak to your heart, I would encourage you. If you, if Some of you, you haven't walked an aisle, and you may not. The next time you come down an aisle, will be a casket. They'll bring it down and set it in front of you. But maybe the Spirit of God needs to work in your heart. And he has. He's rattled your cage, not from a pastor, but from a God in heaven who loves you and cares for you. And it really wants you to be prosperous. God delights in the prosperity of his children. But you need to dig down and say, you know what? I need to let the word of God bring joy and spiritual renewal in my heart.